So let's dive in. We have three guests with us today, um, the authors of Docs for Developers. We have Jared Buddy, um, Zach Carlison, and Dave Nunes. And together with Heidi Waterhouse and Jen Lamburn, they created Docs for Developers over the, um, over the course of the pandemic, probably. So um, yeah, I have, sorry, give them a warm welcome, heads up. And um, let's get started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alyssa and Tina. Um, so uh, we're here to speak today about our book that we recently published, uh, Docs for Developers. Um, and we want to focus on just the process that it took to write this book on dev docs and some of the lessons that we learned. And uh, you know, just reach out to you, the community, who really helped us put this book together. So. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the, the agenda for our talk this evening. Um, I want to just give a quick introduction, a bit of a kickoff about you know, who we are, about the book, um, and then talk a bit about the inspiration of what led us to write this book, the response that we've gotten from developers, some of the advice that we've gotten uh, and learned uh, through our process of writing that we'd like to share with you, the community and uh, help some of the ways that you can help us. I uh, did want to hit on uh, some of the things that came up in the poll that we did earlier. So uh, um, you know, I, I know that uh, we wanna cover what developers expect from Docs and also like the, provide you with some inspiration about how to get devs to contribute to documentation and some tips on how you, you might work with developers and do your job better. So these are things that we're going to try to convey to you, as well as uh, you know, inspire you about uh, the field of tech writing as, as we have been. So next slide, please. And next slide. So just a little bit about who we are. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, my name is Jared Bati. Uh, I've been a tech writer for 17 years and uh, most of that has been at Google, although recently I've moved up to Waymo where I've been working on content. Um, I've done a lot of open source projects with uh, Kubernetes and the Linux Foundation. Um, working closely with uh, you know, David Nunez, and, uh, who, uh, who works at Stripe, and Zach Corlison, who is at the Linux Foundation and has also recently moved to Stripe. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, our, our co-authors who aren't here tonight, but will be at other talks. Uh, Heidi is actually speaking at a, another conference in Oakland. Um, she's at Launch Darkly. And uh, Jen, who's in the UK, uh, who's at Monza. So the, uh, the five of us got together with the idea of writing this book and we really sought each other out because we represent different perspectives on the developer experience based on the organizations that we work at. So this is my plug and it won't be the first, so it won't be the last, it is the first. Um, but if you haven't already, uh, you can get our book directly from the publisher, uh, from your local bookstore, from your local library, or from Amazon. Um, if you are a person in, I know that global supply chains are quite a mess right now. So if you have a situation where you're finding it very difficult to get the book, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I got a ping on the chat as well for, to uh, post the uh, directly from the publisher link. That is uh, through APRESS. So if you search for Docs for Developers APRESS, you will see the link. I will post that in the chat after the uh, uh, after the talk. So I want to hand this off to David, who's going to talk a bit about our inspiration for writing this book. David? Jared, and I'm going to take a quick moment to thank uh, Elisa and Tina and everybody uh, who's up super late or super early or just taking time out of their day. It's, it's super humbling to uh, see so many people on the call. Uh, so we we were all for the most part strangers um i don't think a lot of people know this that jared had assembled and converged on this book as like a social experiment as well and uh, it was pretty exciting early on that we all uh talked about 
the the lack of a resource that we could trust pointing to people as we constantly had conversations. And it, it was really cool to see that uh, the other co-authors would uh, have conversations with strangers on LinkedIn that asked for advice. Um, and it was the, I think the challenge wasn't having the same conversations over and over. It was at least for me, that feeling of like, you're done with the conversation and you feel like you missed something or there's something else you wanted to say, or there's something you could have said better. And that was the, that was always the worst feeling for me. And there was no follow-up aside from just like 10 more paragraphs of like, do this, do this, do this. Um, so I think that was a pretty, a pretty common thread for all of us, like having something that we could, we could trust, uh, as a source of, of guidance. Um, we also, uh, agreed that developers increasingly want to write better documentation. And I think that's, that's a theme that has, uh, that has uh, surprised some of us, at least me, over the years. And documentation is is cool to a lot of developers. They just they've moved from the uh, just give me the template so I could fill it out to like, hey, how do I think about information architecture? How do I think about the different content types? How do I think about the user journey? And uh, we didn't really have a resource that could keep up with those desires. Uh, and the other idea was uh, writers that are coming into the field that, you know, the, the experience can vary based on where you're landing. What is the environment? What are the tools you're using? What's the methodology? And so we, we all talked about what's a book that distills the core principles into uh, best practices that they can use, like irrespective of tools and, and, and methodologies and environments. And, and that, was, that was a goal going in. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the journey uh, from where we started to where we ended up. So the the working title, we had two working titles, actually. We had the unofficial working title, which was more of an objective uh, that Heidi had had brought to the table, which was minimum viable documentation. And so we didn't, uh, we all agreed this wasn't the right title, but it was the idea that we wanted uh, to, to execute, which was not to give uh, developers a thick handbook that would solve all of their problems, but what is the minimum uh, information that would help them be successful for the majority of projects that they're going to, going to encounter? So the other working title was effective developer documentation that we were shopping around to publishers, and we felt like it was uh, it was uh, descriptive, um, but not quite resonating with with the the audience that we're going for. And I think Zach, pretty late in the process, I'll give you credit, Zach uh, came up with Docs for Developers. Uh, actually, when we spent maybe like the, the third or fourth hour talking about just the subtitle. We thought the subtitle would solve all of our problems. And uh, of course it was, it went from like 25 words to 10 words. And then we all rallied around the phrase field guide. We love that idea of like, you're on the field, you have this worn copy in your back pocket, you can thumb through it, it'll help you survive uh, in a life or death doc situation. And uh, so Zach said docs for developers, uh, we all loved it and uh, agreed that was the title. And it also helped steer the end, uh, the, the end stage of the book where we had all the raw material, we were still figuring out the order, we were still fi figuring out the common narrative, um, but Docs for Developers became the, the objective as well as the title. And we, we talked about the basics, that was pretty clear, like let's not make many assumptions, let's focus on what are the core building blocks that developers are gonna need to write great docs. Uh, but importantly, we obsessed over the order of operations, maybe a little a little too much, but we thought that was key uh, in, in terms of, I think it was Jared that would bring us back to this idea of like, let's imagine an engineer is on the hook for delivering great documentation and uh, they, they don't have the luxury of consuming like a 300, 400 page text. Like they want to stay just one step ahead. And so we kept that idea in mind and, and um, we thought about the order of operations, not just like what's what's common and what you're going to do first and, and second and, and so on, but where are you going to get the most leverage? Like if you're doing one thing first, what, where are you going to get the most leverage of that down the line? So the order was really key. And I think even after we got the initial proofs from the publisher, we did a, a pretty big uh, change in the order again, and we ultimately felt good of, of where it landed. Um, and another thing that that happened uh, semi-late in the process is as we were talking about this order, as we would debate over the 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 principles, like if we were still adhering to them, um, I think we we uh, converged converged on this idea of like, well, who, what would the what would the developer actually do in this situation? Like, what are they on the hook for? Who are they talking with? Who are their users? What would they be doing? What would they be thinking? And that was a really useful exercise to like 
get out from our own heads of what is the expertise we're trying to get on the page and more so what is the use case here. Uh, so we came up with the narrative of Charlotte, a lead engineer at a startup, trying to launch a software product. And the documentation wasn't like creating great documentation wasn't her goal, her initial goal. Her, her initial goal, uh, along with her teammates, was shipping successful software. And so adoption was important. Being able to scale their, their support was, was uh, really important. And so that I, I hope is a helpful narrative device for users because you can kind of map where uh, where the team is, where the what the use case is as you read the lessons in the book. Um, but it was it was really useful for us to be able to get in the minds of the of the uh, characters in this story and figure out what would they need, what would they do, what would their challenges be. So that was uh, that was a fun aspect of the book. Um, Another important thing for us was we didn't want to just say, hey, here's what worked for us, like go do this. Like we really wanted to check our assumptions and and uh, see what research was out there. So uh, the good news was there's a lot of research out there in the uh, design uh, or the the information design space, the uh, information architecture space, the, the um, user experience space, but not for tech writing specifically. So we had to do a lot of extrapolation, but um, we really wanted to make sure that we were checking checking our assumptions before we would put things in the book, uh, and I think I think uh, Zach might touch on this, or maybe uh, I didn't check your slide. But uh, one thing Jared had mentioned in another talk was that uh, there's a there's a dearth of research out there for tech writing. So we want to encourage other people out there to do more research and uh, and publish it. That would that would really help the field a lot. Um, and with that. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Zach. Um, thank you, Jared and Dave. So, uh, advice. Uh, this is remarkably difficult to constrain, uh, which is actually uh, relevant to the book itself. Um, we produced probably another book and a half worth of material that we cut out from our final draft because it did not meet the very narrow focus that we agreed upon uh, to, to frame this book. Uh, so there's room for a lot more books out there. Uh, like Dave mentioned, as a, as a lead in, um, there's really not much crossover between uh, academic research on technical communication and the, uh, applied technical writing. Uh, the, the only person who comes readily to mind uh, is uh, Bob Watson. Uh, so there's, um, I know that there are academic programs out there, but, uh, they're, if they are putting out material, uh, it's not really sort of on, uh, any of our radar, uh, our specifically meaning the author's radar, uh, of, um, things that we consult in order to, um, uh, improve or develop our professional practice. So there is a lot of room. Uh, to write books that intersect uh, academic research around technical communication and applied technical writing. Um, so if I were to sum all of this advice up, uh, I, would say, um, I would say it in three pieces. I would say identify, define, and fill a need. Uh, in our case, uh, we identified uh, a need for a complete how to write documentation from start to finish uh, with or for specifically for software developers with really no assumptions made about where someone would be starting. And we defined that need very precisely, uh, like Jared talked about, to the journey of a software developer tasked with writing documentation for uh, a launch. And so uh, we identified the need, we scoped it, and then we filled it by writing a book, which sounds very, but uh, a lot went into that. Um, we can speak at length about that, but the second piece of advice that I would offer is um, find the publisher that's right for you and your project. Uh, so Jared mentioned that uh, it's, uh, what it's, oh, sorry. It's, uh, is not mentioned yet, but uh, this book took about 16 months to write. Uh, 
And the reason it took so long, partly global pandemic, but also partly we spent about three months of that in what I would call a discovery phase of working, uh, talking with different publishers. Um, none of us had published a book before. So uh, we were coming to the process very naively. Uh, and we sort of learned a lot about publishers. And in retrospect, there was a lot of advice that we could have taken if we had looked for it and discovered it. So I would say um, you could save yourself a lot of time and potentially a lot of frustration uh, by identifying the publisher who's um, right for you and your project. The, the last piece of advice that I would give about writing a book um, is uh, just to do it. The, the, the doing of it is how you do it. Uh, I know that's sort of a koan, but uh, I went into this process not having written a book before, thinking that there was it was somehow a magical process, that uh, uh, there was something in it that I just didn't get, uh, and that I would have to uh, you know sort of unlock the secret fire uh, in order to write a book. As it turns out, it's just work. It's a lot of work, but it's just work. Uh, so. Uh, if you have a book in you, and I would, I would say that most people are working in technical writing right now, um, there's a decent chance that you have something really valuable to offer uh, to the fields, to your fellow writers, uh, to software developers. Uh, I would say absolutely, um, write a book about it. Um, make sure that you identify and constrain a need and then write to that need uh, with a publisher who supports you. Um, some other things just to say, uh, sort of one-off nuggets of advice. Um, I mentioned that there's not much academic research that's entering the applied discipline of technical writing. There's also not much authoritative market research on standards and, and best practices for the business value of technical documentation. Um, you, may be, you may have some experience with always feeling like you have to justify your existence when an executive who is uh, maybe not even uh, you know, like opposed to you, but just has never worked with a technical writer before, it just says, now, what do you do? Why are you here? Why are we paying your salary? Um, at one point, um, Dave, Jared, and I had talked about jointly funding a Nielsen Norman Group report on uh, technical writing and the business value thereof. Um, I still hope that we do that because uh, it's still necessary. Uh, so uh, if you if you have ins with the Nielsen Norman Group, uh, you know, they, I can identify at least three people who would uh, very much like to give you money. Um, so uh, to the question in chat, uh, is all that material going to end up as a part two book? We haven't discussed that yet. We just published in October. Uh, we're still in the uh, being done and resting part of the, of the book life cycle. Uh, but uh, I mean, for my part, I can say, um, pretty confidently that um, uh, having seen the response to this book and seeing how well it's been received and how much enthusiasm there is around it, I can't imagine not writing more about this. Um, so I know in the initial poll, uh, the top rated question was, um, what do developers expect from docs? Uh, frankly, that sounds like an excellent book topic. So uh, I would consider, uh, how would you find that out? Uh, how would you identify that? How would you scope it? And how would you write to it? Because uh, that's a book that I would read. Um, so, I mean, there's a good book idea right there. Uh, so the second uh, highest rated topic, or yeah, the second uh, highest upvoted topic was, well, what are the latest trends in developer documentation? Um, I think the, the answer to that is to look at the tooling around documentation that developers produce. And to that end, I see increasing ease. Um, you know, like DocuSaurus, that's a, a framework for, for writing and maintaining documentation. Things that make documentation easier, fewer, uh, like less technical gatekeeping around uh, the act of creating and publishing documentation. Um, I think there's still core needs, but if I were, uh, giving advice about how to write a book or about writing a book about trends in documentation, uh, I would look first at the tooling. I would look at emerging tooling and uh, extrapolate from there about um, 
what the needs are in documentation that are um, newly being met. All right, so uh, writing in a group was really weird. Um, I will say frankly, uh, I'm really glad that I went into it with a lot of na naivete. Um, it was a beautiful experience. Um, and that said, uh, I had a wonderful time doing it. Everyone in this project was wonderful. I know that's the thing that like we're supposed to say about each other, but in this case, it's really true. Uh, everybody who said yes to this project, uh, all of the co-authors, like we still talk to each other in Slack all the time because uh, we formed a really tight-knit group. Uh, and it was just a delight to work with each other. And that said, I will never like write with five authors again. Uh, just because of how much of a challenge it ended up being sometimes. Um, and also, I don't think the, that lightning strikes twice. Uh, this kind of collaboration seems like it happens only once with a great deal of serendipity. So um, that said, there are some things that you can plan for. Uh, some, there were some aspects that we front-loaded in terms of planning and that uh, we did in terms of process along the way that made this uh, process as good as it was and as effective as it was. 16 months, honestly, and a global pandemic, not that long to write a book, especially one uh, on that fills this kind of need. So um, here's some specific things that I recommend uh, for, for planning to write a book. Um, if you're going to write about documentation, uh, eat your own dog food and document your book. Make a style guide. Uh, agree upfront, especially if you're co-authoring, um, what style conventions you're going to follow. Um, what, one of the things that really helped us was agreeing early on um, what our roles would be, sort of who was going to do what, and then um, offering mutual support to each other uh, in doing those things, and also being flexible, um, being able to negotiate and navigate uh, as those roles and responsibilities changed over time. So um, clear expectations uh, made the book a lot easier to write. Um, have process values. So I think one of the things that really helped us was um, understanding upfront that we were going to disagree about some things and having clear expectations about what would happen when we did, how would we express disagreement, how would we resolve it, and what would we do um, after that resolution, after achieving resolution. So um, just anticipating conflict uh, and building a graceful resolution into the writing process. Um, I think one of the, for me, one of the most invaluable resources, um, and this is uh, really on Jared because he just does it compulsively. Uh, it's like a, he's a meeting minutes shark. He just keeps swimming all the time. Uh, the meeting minutes for our, uh, we had a weekly sync where uh, we would um, come together and talk about our progress on the book, things that we needed to talk about. And Jared documented that exhaustively in the form of meeting minutes. I reference those all the time. So uh, yeah, I would, uh, I recommend um, if you're going to write about documentation, practice documentation as you're writing. Uh, document your own work is how I would summarize all of that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so yes, it does take longer than you think. Uh, 16 months, start to finish. That was a long slog. Um, you know, Jared and I first started talking about doing a book, I think in uh, August of 2019. And it turned into, uh, Jared and I had been talking for, I think, close to a year about the difficulties that we were experiencing, um, training the kinds of questions that we were getting from engineers, the kinds of reviews that we were offering, the kinds of uh, pull requests that we were seeing open against documentation. And uh, that turned from a sort of a, a mutual sympathy session into a, you know, gosh, I wish somebody would write a book about that. And then that turned into, oh, we're probably gonna have to write that book. And then that turned into, can we write that book? And then into, we're writing a book. Uh, so there was a lot more discovery time if you count that as well. Um, I think, uh, one of the benefits of um, co-authoring a book was that at various times, we were all done with this book. Uh, thankfully, um, it happened in such a way that not all of us were completely done with it at the same time. Uh, it was sort of a, a nicely staggered uh, experience of ennui. So uh, like, 
there was a point, you know, a couple of weeks in there where, uh, Dave, I think you were ready to just like walk into the desert and be done. And I was ready to, you know, walk backwards into the sea, just, you know, completely done with the book. Uh, and so being able to, um, uh, like support each other through this, uh, uh, this very long process in, uh, in the middle of a very rapidly changing world was critical. Um, so that's one thing I would recommend is build in support systems for yourself, because this will take longer than you think. Uh, make sure that you have uh, people around you to encourage you in the work. Um, if you don't have anybody immediately offhand, this community is wonderful. Um, create accountability for yourself in the community. And not just accountability, but encouragement as well. And there is plenty of it. Um, next slide, please. You do have a lot of allies. Um, this community has been invaluable. Uh, all of the uh, inspiration that we've received, all of the support and affirmation that we've received um, from specifically the Write the Docs community has inspired us for years. I think Jared and I are both uh, like first timers. We were both in Portland in 2013. Uh, and it's been uh, really remarkable, uh, just the, the ongoing inspiration that we take uh, from this community and that hopefully we give back. Um, there are people around you who want you to succeed at writing about uh, developer documentation. And for us, uh, really, it just took, I think, saying it out loud for um, several developers to kind of come out of the woodwork and say, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you're doing this and uh, offer their help in like writing code samples, reviewing code samples, uh, offering feedback on early drafts, things like that. It was, um, it was very helpful. And that same kind of help is available to you. Uh, so um, the, there are some ways that you can help us. And if you can advance to the next slide, please. If you are interested uh, in advancing the cause of this book uh, or advancing the cause of um, books to come, whether uh, ours or hopefully your own, um, read the book. Go to your local library. If you don't want to pay somebody for it, uh, make sure that your local library buys it. Uh, you know, by, by whatever way that you come to it, read the book. Um, if you don't like the book, great. It means you read it and had a strong reaction to it. Uh, we're very interested uh, in, in your feedback. Um, and to that end, please write a review. That's one thing we're, we're getting a lot of really, really enthusiastic uh, sort of anecdotal feedback, but we haven't really seen anyone write a very thoughtful uh, book review. Uh, and that would be incredibly helpful uh, if someone wants to do uh, a, a book review. I think that would be incredibly valuable. Uh, if you want to do that in a place where other people are contemplating spending their money on this book, amazing. Uh, but nonetheless, please review. Uh, and finally, uh, share about it. Uh, share your experience with this book. Just share its existence. Uh, share the fact that this book exists. Uh, yeah. The next slide. I think we're done. So yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Uh, Thank you to the entire Write the Docs community. Um, and especially thank you to Rhea and McNamara, who gave us really good uh, early feedback on the book. Um, to Lisa Carey at Google, to Eric Holscher, uh, and uh, to all of the folks in Write the Docs and Beyond who made this book possible. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me see if I can find my video again. Um, unfortunately, Tina had to, um, there, my video is going now. Tina had to step out. She's not feeling super well. Uh, but we are now totally open to doing Q&A with the authors. So if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the chat, um, and we'll take a little bit of time to talk about whatever questions you have with the authors. So, oh, here we have a question from the chat. What topics did you include in the book? So give us a preview of what's in the book. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so we really wanted to encompass the process of writing uh, documentation with the process of you know, crafting code. So, 
Uh, we really start from the very beginning of understanding your audience through user studies, through you know testing your own software, through uh, maybe doing a friction log. So like going through your software, going through the process that the user is going to do, and you know from a from the initial standpoint of experiencing your software for the first time, um, you're trying to say like, well, what what knowledge do I already have? And how do I let that go in order to help people and empathize with them when they're using my product for the very first time? Um, we also, you know, from there went to the process of planning documentation, of creating a doc plan, uh, crafting specific docs around user templates and kind of the, the guidance around uh, what are the specific needs that different types of documentation uh, meet for your user and for your reader. Um, then of course, the just fundamentals of drafting and editing docs to um, you know, integrating various additional uh, uh, bells and whistles, code samples, uh, videos, graphics. Um, and then dead center in the middle of the book is publishing, <laughs> uh, which is pretty rare in a lot of, uh, of these books that I've read. Publishing is usually at the end and you say hurrah and then publishing is done. Um, but I think for the vast majority of us, we realize that like the it, it, is that coding sorry that the publishing is just sort of the is, is right in the middle where you have to evaluate the feedback that you get, look at the metrics, see how people are responding to it, incrementing on that documentation over time, and it's really similar with code. People push that initial bit of code to production, and then they have to look at that code and go, okay, like. Does this actually work? Do I need to update it? And that's something that we wanted to include as well. So after you you publish your docs, we talk about feedback, metrics, measuring quality. Um, we talk a little bit about how to organize documentation as well. Um, but we also know that there's uh, many books about information architecture. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, an appendix on uh, at some point, you're going to hit a level of complexity where you're going to want to hire a technical writer or a documentarian. So you uh, here are some of the cases that you're going to hit as a, you know, a scrappy engineer writing your own documentation where you're going to have to take a step back and say, I might want to hire a professional right now. Um, so that's a quick snapshot of, uh, of what's in our book. There is a, a chapter uh, chapter table of contents on the um, publisher sites that you can peruse that gives the chapter titles and sort of rough uh, size of each chapter to give you an idea of what's in the book. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm picking this question because it seemed like an interesting one. Where did developers and writers have overlapping concerns and were there any conflicting concerns? You know, I can grab this one. Um, I think those are great questions and they're outside the scope of the book. Uh, we wrote this book very specifically for a developer journey. Um, so th there's sort of an anecdote about the history of the book though. Uh, my, the, the proposal that I originally made to Jared uh, and that we originally pitched to others was um, the book of missing pieces, all of the things that we wish we had known uh, when we were starting out as technical writers. And the focus of the book changed over time to focus very specifically uh, on the uh, documentation journey of a software developer um, writing external facing docs. I know there was a question in chat about uh, uh, internally versus externally facing, and we focused very specifically on externally facing docs. So um, yeah, we didn't really uh, address uh, or write this book for like professional technical writers. It's not, um, yeah, that's, that's not our primary audience for the book. We wrote for developers. Um, I think there are probably interesting things that technical writers can take from this book or will find, uh, you know, like read it and be like, oh, but you didn't talk about that and you needed to talk about that if you wanna be complete. And uh, we talked about 
the developer journey uh, and, and uh, came up with a lot more, but cut out the rest of it. wasn't uh, very clearly paving that developer journey. Very cool. Um, I'm picking out this other question that seemed interesting. What advice from your own experience did you change based on your research for the books? Like, were there anything in your per personal writing strategies that changed as a result for, of writing the book? Take this one. Um, there were some. There were some things that come to mind from the research, but uh, a lot of things that come to mind for me were just learning from other authors and seeing what they had learned at their prospective companies. One one thing that I had uh, learned was like. FAQs are not like an ideal type of content. I was like a very big FAQ guy because for all the reasons why it's probably not <laughs> um, that we're veering away from it because it, you know, it covers a lot of gaps when you should probably document uh, the information that you have in the right way and it can get, it can get pretty unwieldy. So that was a fun one for me. I was like, oh, cool. I guess I learned something new. Um, just being reminded over and over to uh, be concise, I think. Like that wasn't a new lesson, but it was a lesson to relearn again, especially when you're trying to convey all the thoughts in your head. Uh, that came from us reading our own chapters and from uh, from the test readers. So that is always a good lesson to, to relearn. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'll wrap it up there. Okay. Um, Jared and Zach, anything you want to add? Just curious if anything changed for you. I, I have something similar to David where I was keying off a lot of the other, it, it's wonderful working with this amazing group of, of tech writers and learning from each other and writing a book is just a different medium. Um, but working with, uh, Heidi Waterhouse, she does a phenomenal job of conveying how good it feels to publish something and how good it feels to push code to production and how good it feels to accomplish things and really tying in the, the feeling of doing something with uh, like, like conveying that to readers is really important, especially in a book when you're trying to convince people to do a thing that they might be reluctant to do. They might have a lot of anxiety about. So it was, uh, I had to break out of my own style of giving readers just like, okay, steps one through 10, this will publish a doc for you. And take a step back and say, okay, at this point, you might feel a bit of anxiety because you're staring at a blank page. And let me just acknowledge that anxiety and help you through it. Um, so that's that was a really powerful lesson for me uh, and something that I have taken back to how I how I write now. Very cool. Zach, yeah. were you going to add one? Okay. Oh, uh, just um, props to Heidi. Uh, that was really her expertise coming through and talking about the experiential aspect of um, writing docs, uh, and being new to writing docs, or even uh, just yeah, the the whole experience of. Uh, facing a blank page, but then also having very concrete strategies uh, to get over a block. And um, she enumerates those in a way that, uh, you know, I think that a lot of writers do instinctually, but that Heidi was able to um, lay out very clearly uh, with, um, like, with very little judgment around it at all. So uh, yeah, that was a uh, yeah, plus one. Very cool. All right, another question for you. When documentation reaches that minimum viable doc level, what are some overlooked elements to keep in mind to keep the docs from getting worse? Ooh, I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, I mean, I think for, I, mean, I think one, there's ways that we as, as tech writers, you know, have, have unique expertise here. Um, but one of the, like we, we have a chapter on maintenance and deprecation uh, is key to uh, to con the content life cycle. And we also want to tie that with the, uh, the software development life cycle. There's a whole maintenance and deprecation side of software too. And it's important to keep those in sync. And so we, we talk about that. Um, and then we, we also, 
um, mentioned just proactively communicating to to your reader uh, of if what paths are going to go away over time. And if this particular feature is going to go away, then you should explain that to them. You should uh, do that proactively. I feel like there's a lot of sort of launch and forget that happens in, in tech and in the software development world. Um, and people will gradually lose trust in uh, your documentation and your product if uh, your documentation doesn't convey in an honest way what the status of your features are. Very cool. So um, let's do one last question before we maybe wrap up. We can have an extended Q&A, which we're planning to do during the breakout room time. So we will have some more opportunities to ask questions. Um, but I'll take this last question before we do breakout rooms. Um, do you feel that the principles in the book would apply equally to internal documentation, meaning documentation meant for people internally in a company? Uh, since somebody brought up internal docs, I have to jump in because, uh, well, Jared is actually an internal docs uh, expert as well and uh, working on that right now. So I will try and keep this short. Um, I think it is, um, I think the, the core principles can map, but you're dealing with very different dynamics. So it's hard to apply the external uh, uh, lessons internally. You're, I think the, the biggest changes are, are the people dynamics. Like you don't have the customer facing pressure. You don't have the amount of feedback streaming in. Uh, so you have to do a lot, a lot more like handcrafted bespoke uh, work on the internal doc side. You might have a lot of great feedback, but it's only like five data points, but those are high signal data points. Um, so you really have to focus on the, on the qualitative feedback internally, I think, uh, versus the, versus the external side. Um, and you're usually dealing with, um, uh, with a, a mix of different types of content that you really have to suss out. So the best, uh, the best advice that I like to give with internal docs is like delineate the internal user docs, uh, and then apply the principles to that from external user docs and not worry about the team internal docs themselves. Uh, but I'll let Jared add his thoughts as well. Yeah, go for it, Jared. Oh, I, I mean, I thought that answer was, was excellent. So, uh, um, I do think that, um, you know, the team dynamics are really important of like, what, like who, who is your audience? And when we created this book, one of the reasons why we created a framing story is because we were, we were really struggling of like, what about this internal doc? What about like these API docs? What about design docs? What about like, we kept on finding all these corner cases where we as tech writers might step in. Um, but we really wanted to create a sort of rock solid case of like, you're a developer, you are speaking to an audience that you might not fully understand, but you think you understand. Um, so the framing story that we had was uh, the startup, Corgly, that's creating a dog bark translation API. Uh, they, you know, are planning on launching and it's going to be big, but none of the people using their API understands how to use it. So that framing story really drove a lot of our narrative uh, and our focus. Um, but I do a lot of internal docs. I, I worked on Google Cloud, did a ton of external docs for Google Cloud. Um, I'm now at Waymo. I'm focused entirely on internal docs. I use the same principles. Um, and it's actually nice to go to engineers and use them to like teach them the principles of writing good documentation and being in that loop and helping them become more self-sufficient. So that way I'm operating at a slightly higher level where I'm designing information architecture, gathering feedback uh, from other engineering teams, sort of doing a more strategic planning level. Um, and that's, uh, that's been my experience. So I found it useful as well. Very cool. Okay. Well, that was excellent. Um